Further introductions, it's now time for member statements. The member from Wellington and Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, it is a distinct privilege to rise in this House on this first day of the fall sitting after a busy and productive summer season in Wellington Halton Hills. Like most members of this House, in recent months I've had countless meetings and also had the opportunity to attend numerous community events and celebrations in our riding. One of those events was approximately 15 years in the making. On August the 9th, we gathered to officially turn the ground on our new Groves Memorial Community Hospital in the Township of Centre Wellington. The beginning of the construction of our new hospital is the culmination of an extraordinary community effort. We have worked together, building the future of primary health care for our residents, and I believe that our efforts are a shining example of innovation, collaboration and partnership. Once again, I want to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues in local government, successive councils and staff of the Township of Centre Wellington and councils and staff of the County of Wellington for their vision and leadership. We acknowledge the Government of Ontario and thank the staff at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, Infrastructure Ontario and the Waterloo Wellington Lynn. But our deepest expression of gratitude must be extended to the Groves Hospital staff and volunteers, the board, the foundation, our donors and indeed the entire community, everyone in the hospital's catchment area for their hard work, patience, persistence and generosity. I was glad to work with them over the years and support them every step of the way. We look forward to the day, now about two years away, when our new hospital is completed and our community finally has the new, modern, state-of-the-art hospital that we have earned. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this summer I met with the board chairs of seven London area agencies that provide vital mental health services for children and youth, who shared urgent concerns about the crisis in children and youth mental health created by years of chronic underfunding. Each month, the boards of these agencies, which include Vanier, Ways, Craigwood, Marymount, Inago, and London Family Court Clinic, are not only forced to consider service cuts, but whether they can continue to keep their doors open. Over the last 25 years, these agencies have received only two modest increases in base funding, no increases under the Conservatives and no increases under the Liberals since 2006. In the face of a 53 per cent rise in cost of living and an alarming spike in demand, in the last two years alone, London saw a 23 per cent increase in children's mental health crisis intake, with almost one quarter of these young people planning or attempting suicide. Ongoing funding shortfalls have led to unacceptably long waits for treatment, with the police or the hospital filling the gap. In 2016, London police dealt with almost 500 incidents related to youth mental health, more than double the number from 2010. And 61% of London youth entering a community-based treatment program for the first time had been admitted to hospital at least twice before. Speaker, I have yet to receive a response from the Premier to the the letter I sent her in June about this crisis. Londoners deserve a government that puts the mental health needs of children first. Thank, Thank you. you. Member Stevens, member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to say a few words in memory of a constituent of mine, uh, Rick Sovieta. Rick passed away on August 26 after a courageous battle with pancreatic cancer. Rick came to Canada as a small boy with his family, and they settled in the heart of Ottawa and football became his passion. He played locally, college ball at the University of Richmond Spiders, and began his professional career with the Toronto Argonauts, and returned to play for the Ottawa Rough Riders for eight years as number 75. He was a tough and competitive linebacker. Rick had a passion for food as well, and opened Rick's Cantina after his football career. Rick's famous salsa was a staple in our family for many years and it's still the standard by which we measure all salsas. Rick coached many minor and high school football teams, building character and skills in many young players. He was a true fighter and became involved in raising the awareness of pancreatic cancer. Most importantly, Rick was a husband, a father, and a true friend to many. A kind and gentle person, he listened well and always showed a genuine interest. I think that's uh, why my late father found a kindred spirit in him. Rick's few words were always well chosen and thoughtful. So to Jenny and the family and all his friends, may you all find comfort in knowing that the world is a better place for Rick Soietta having been in it. Thank you. Thank you. 
further members' statements, the member from Bruce Gray owen -Sell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. I, along with my colleagues, am proudly wearing a gold ribbon to express support for the children and families affected by the tremendous hardship of life-threatening illnesses. It's essential to highlight the severity of cancer and its impact on the lives of children and their families, how we may strive to continue to fight and advocate for an end to the suffering it causes. Currently, cancer is the second leading cause of death among kids in Canada. Although rare among children in comparison to adults, the lingering effects of diagnosis, treatment and recovery can last a lifetime. That's why the fight against childhood cancer should never be fought alone. We wear the gold ribbon pin today in recognition and support of the families and children who are forced to battle life-threatening illnesses to show that we stand in solidarity with them and their fight. One in 330 children will be diagnosed with some form of cancer by the time they're 20 years old. The staggering statistic was a key factor in the creation of POGO, the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, founded by Dr. Corinne Greenberg, who is with us today in the members' gallery. Dr. Greenberg's tireless advocacy and research led to the expansion of the province-wide registry of childhood cancer to include standardized, wide-ranging information on an entire patient population and critical dimensions of their care. With input from the five pediatric oncology treatment programs in Ontario, this resource now produces much of the information required for planning pediatric cancer care. It's one of the few such databases in existence. Let us be reminded that while there are health care professionals such as Dr. Greenberg who have dedicated their lives to this fight, to saving and improving the lives of children with cancer, we need to continue to do more to illustrate our solidarity. The fight to end childhood cancer must never be fought alone, and the month of September, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, is a stark reminder of that commitment. I ask all of us to continue to fight and take action to build a world free from these life-threatening illnesses. It is my hope that we will soon, for the dream of my hero, Cherry Fox, find a cure for all cancers. Somewhere, the hurting must stop. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members, a statement the member from London Fanshawe. As MPP for London Fanshawe, I am proud to speak to the terrible racist incidents that have taken place most recently in Charlottesville and the horrific Quebec mosque shootings. Racism, bigotry, and discrimination continue to be among the greatest challenges we face in Ontario. That is why it is crucial that we continue to build on the progress we have made. Our work is not done. The NDP pushed the government to reintroduce an anti-racism directorate, and I was honoured to introduce a motion declaring October Islamic Heritage Month. In August, an anti-Islamic Islam group rallied a few dozen people outside London City Hall to spread their message of hate and intolerance. Hundreds of Londoners responded by rallying together and making it clear that there is no place for any form of bigotry or discrimination in our city. In my riding of London Fanshawe, my office has started a working group dedicated to ending the insidious racism that persists in our lives. Together, we started an End Racism Pledge to root out systemic racial discrimination, to acknowledge our own prejudices and privilege, and to call out racism whenever we encounter it. Written by leaders of diverse communities, the pledge is just one example of the important work that is being done in London. But we must continue to take a stand against racism, to listen first and understand the perspectives of those who experience racism daily, to educate one another, and to enact an anti-oppression framework through legislation. All of us together need to continue the work to end racism. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, the first Ukrainian immigrants to Canada, Vasily Yanyak and Ivan Pilipi, arrived in Canada 126 years ago on September 7, 1891. Since then, many Ukrainians have left their homeland to, find, to flee oppression, to find freedom, and to find a better life, and many have found that life here in Ontario. My grandparents and my mother were some of those people. They and so many others in the community will always be grateful to Ontario and to Canada for that. In fact, that's why, uh, as proud as my grandparents were of their Ukrainian heritage, uh, they often said that they were the proudest Canadians that they ever knew, and they're certainly the proudest Canadians that I've ever known. At the same time, Speaker, uh, Ukrainians uh, living here in Ontario have made important contributions to our province and to our country. They've contributed to our economic, our social, our cultural, and our political life, and have helped make Canada the great country that it is today. For these reasons, Speaker, in 2011, this legislature unanimously passed a bill proclaiming Ukrainian Heritage Day on September 7th of every year. I was honoured to have worked with members on all sides of this legislature on this bill. I am also proud, Speaker, of the work that our government has done with Ontario's Ukrainian-Canadian community. We've included the internment of Ukrainian-Canadians and the Holodomor in Ontario's curriculum. We've provided funding for the Holodomor mobile classroom that will teach children across Ontario about the Holodomor, and our government has stood in support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and condemned Russia's occupation of Ukraine. Today, Speaker, I am proud. 
proud of my Ukrainian heritage, proud of the work our government has done with the community, and proud of the contributions that the community has made to Ontario and to Canada. Happy Ukrainian Heritage Day. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm excited today to offer congratulations to an athlete from my riding who is a real hometown hero. Jeremy Fritz, a native of Florence, Ontario, has been wrestling professionally under the ring name Eric Young for almost 20 years. Jeremy, as Eric Young, first made a splash in 2004 when he debuted in TNA. He then went on to capture the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, an X Division Championship, three TNA King of the Mountain Championships, and an incredible four Tag Team Championships. Altogether, he won 11 cha championships in TNA before finally achieving his dream and signing with WWE in April of 2016. Now wrestling in WWE's NXT brand as part of a mysterious faction called Sanity, Jeremy's Eric Young persona continues to bring excitement and pride to WWE fans in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex and across Canada. His most recent victory came on August 19th at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3 when he and fellow Sanity member Alexander Wolf bested the formerly undefeated Authors of Pain to capture the prestigious NXT Tag Team Championships. Speaker, I congratulate Jeremy on his thrilling victory in Brooklyn, and I look forward to seeing many more great matches from him in NXT as member of Sanity. Thank you. Thank you. I will resist making a comment, I promise. <laughs> Member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm thrilled to host the faculty, staff, and students from Queen's University in my riding of Kingston and the Islands for their Queen's Park Day. Queen's is an integral part of the fabric of Kingston, and the campus and community are deeply intertwined. An impressive $1.5 billion in annual economic activity is created through Queen's, along with countless hours of community service. By fourth year, 60 per cent of students have participated in community community service or volunteer activity, and nearly a third have participated in community-based projects. Just the other week, I attended a gala fundraiser for St. Vincent de Paul's Association in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, and the students raised an astounding $20,000, approximately. Now that's community. Queen's is a key driver of the Eastern Ontario innovation ecosystem, making massive econo economic contributions to this province. With Innovation Park, the Dunandesh Pandy Queen's Innovation Centre, and numerous partnerships between Queen's researchers and industry, they are also a significant contributor to Ontario's highly skilled workforce. Queen's students and faculty are making phenomenal contributions to society with successful commercial innovative, innovative ventures such as Beacon Technologies, Laser Depth Dynamics, Green Centre Canada, Enviro Innovate, and the list goes on. Through the work of Nobel laureate Art MacDonald, Queen's is responsible for changing the very way that we look at and understand the world through the work with neutrinos. Does it get any better than that? I am delighted to welcome Queen's University to celebrate its impact impact on the province and on the riding that I am so proud to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Member from Elgin Mills, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I rise today to highlight Suicide Prevention Day, which was just held yesterday, September 10th. Suicide Prevention Day has been recognized for the last 14 years, the first taking place in September of 2003 by the International Association of Suicide Prevention. This year focuses on the theme of take a minute, change a life. It is crucial for members of our communities to look out for those and connect with many who are struggling. A word of encouragement or taking the time to listen could make all the difference in someone's life. Those who are suffering often say they just wanted someone to intervene and ask them whether or not they were okay. Yet all too often, family and loved ones are reluctant to intervene, even when they are seriously concerned about a loved one. This can sometimes be attributed to not knowing what to say or how to properly address the situation. I would encourage all those who know someone that they are concerned about to reach out and let them know there, is, there are those that care about them and those that can help. Suicide affects all ages, ethnicities, and people of all economic and socioeconomic standings. Each day in Canada, 11 people end their life and 210 make a suicide attempt. We as a society must end the stigma associated with mental health, encourage those who are feeling suicidal to come forward and seek help, and those who suspect someone of struggling to take a minute to reach out and offer support. 
There is more the government can do to prevent and support mental health and prevent suicide. Our communities have lost too many people. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank all members for their uh, statements today, and uh, it is now therefore time for reports by committees. I beg to inform the House that during the adjournment, the clerk received reports on intended appointments dated June 6, 2019.